Hello there, you're watching the Press Preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Welcome both. Welcome. They'll be with us from now until midnight. Well, let's see what is on some of those front pages. Reacting to the High Court's denial of Prince uh, Harry's request to have his police protection reinstated while he's in the UK, the Metro carries the scathing headline, you are not that special. Looking ahead to the budget, the I says the Chancellor has decided he can't afford to address unfairness in the child benefit system because he thinks cutting taxes is more urgent. The Telegraph says he's also set to scrap non-DOM tax status to help fund those tax cuts. The Mirror, meanwhile, speaks to the Shadow Chancellor, who says if Labour wins the next election, it will inherit the worst economic crisis since the Second World War. Their headline, never had it so bad. Let them eat flakes. The star seizes on comments from the boss of Kellogg's that people struggling with the cost of living crisis should eat cereal for dinner. The Guardian carries a study on ultra-processed foods, which it says has found a list of 32 damaging effects that include heart disease, type 2 diabetes and cancer. The Times says that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak wants police to crack down on what he calls disruptive protests over the war in Gaza, which he thinks amount to mob rule. That story is also the front page lead in tomorrow's Daily Mail. The FT leads with a report on leaked Kremlin files suggesting that Russia could resort to nuclear weapons at a very early stage in any conflict with another major world power. And the sun goes with news. The Formula One team boss, Christian Horner, and his wife, Jerry Halliwell, are relieved that he's been cleared of improper behavior towards a female employee. And a reminder, as always, that by scanning the QR code that you'll see on screen during the program, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. As I mentioned, we're joined tonight by Kevin Maguire and Claire Ellicott. Thank you so much for being with us. OK, let's start with the front page of The Telegraph and actually a couple of uh, uh, papers leading with the budget preview, which is in uh, a couple of days. Let's look at the headline of The Telegraph. Um, ditching non-DOM status uh, to allow tax cuts. So Hunt looks at ditching non-DOM uh, tax uh, Perk. Uh, Kevin, starting with you, what do yeah, you make of it? Yeah, I'm sure his uh, non-dom wife will be thrilled. Uh, but it's, it's also on the front of the uh, Times and the FT. Mm -hmm. So whoever's briefed it has gone to the, certainly gone to those papers. And what's extraordinary is Labour is proposing to end non-dom status. Uh, thought initially it could raise 3.6 billion a year. They've cut that down to 2 billion now because it'd be a four-year grace period for anybody. And th these are people who live in Britain but have considerable assets abroad and they can save their assets abroad from, from tax. But it looks as if, according to these briefings, I'll still be surprised mm -hmm. if it happens, the Chancellor is thinking of stealing Labour's clothes and raise, raise money for other tax cuts by doing this, uh, by at the same time still saying he'd, he'd be competitive. Hunt, Sunak, they've all attacked Labour's plan, so I would be surprised if they uh, adopted it thems themselves. Yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, it's quite a surprise. Um, there, he, Jeremy Hunt's obviously already pinched Labour's childcare policies um, to offer parents a better deal. So maybe, they, you know, they are parking their tanks on Labour's lawn. Um, it, it's an interesting one to go for, though, because it's never been particularly popular with the Tory party. They get lots of donations from non-DOMs and, you know, many of their mm. votes, you know, people who support them are going to be wealthy individuals. And, and if you're a Tory, you're going to argue that higher, having higher tax brackets, taxing people lots, scrapping statuses that allow them to, you know, that cost people more money, deters people from coming to the UK, would deter high net wealth individuals from being in the UK. Yeah. So it's an interesting policy for them to pursue. But I wonder if there are concerns about the amount of headroom that the Chancellor has He's under huge pressure from his backbenchers to cut taxes. So maybe they're looking around to see other ways that they can pay for tax cuts mm. to give the backbenchers what they want and to pave a way for a future if, election. If, if, if he doesn't do it, he's now given Labour political cover. Mm. If Labour bring it, bring it in, he, he, he does it, well, you know, there we are. Um, George, George Osborne, when he was Chancellor in the coalition yeah. years, he brought in a relatively small charge to keep your non-DOM status but as i say the you know one of the big beneficiaries of being a non-dom has, has been uh, rishi sunak's wife although she's now kind of suspended the status in in agreeing to pay yeah but she hasn't given up 
as, a, as I understand it, the actual state issue, suspended it and just paying an equivalent amount. Let's take a look at some of the other angles that are coming out of uh, the budget. So, in the eye, this headline, budget won't fix the UK's unfair £50,000 child benefit rules so Hunt can afford tax cuts. Uh, uh, basically, a chancellor doesn't have enough spare money to change child benefit uh, charges that hit middle-income families. And while we look at that, I'd also like to pull out the front page of the mirror which has got the shadow chancellor saying, we've never had it so bad. The Tories have smashed the windows, broken the door, and are now burning the house down. We'll inherit the worst situation uh, since the war. Claire. Yes, so um, the I, this, this story about child benefit rule, it's, um, it's, it's, there's a lot of people who've complained about this. It means that parents, if you have a single parent earning more than £50,000, they have to pay back the child benefit, but a couple earning 49000 pounds a year each doesn't have to. Lots of people are criticising this as unfair. And it's something that I think the Treasury has been looking at. But clearly, they are... We're in the March to Budget Day. It's, going, it's, it's imminent it's next week. And um, the Treasury are going to be focusing on what they can do. And um, it's clear from this splash, it sounds like the Treasury aren't going to be able to, to change this unfair rule because they won't have the money to do it, frankly. And um, they're clearly prioritising, as we say, tax cuts and... Mm -hmm other things to keep Tory backbenchers happy. And, um, it, you know, we'll have to see if it's a winning policy. This was a, an unfairness introduced by George Osborne again when he, when he was Chancellor early in the coalition years. Because, yeah, it, if you have a, it's all about paying child benefit to children. It's, what is it, 50, it's £24 for the first child, £15.90 a week for another child. I don't think those rates have changed much since, uh, you know, since the, the unfairness came in. Because if you've got two people 49,000 each, you're going to have a household income of 98,000 to keep all your child benefit. But next door, there might be one parent on 50,000. And I think the taper goes at, until 60 or 70,000 yeah. when you, loo you lose it all. But the unfairness has always been there. And it's been held down because it was at a 50,000 figure a dozen years ago. Mm. So you think what's happened since then in terms of uh, in inflation yeah. and pay rises, more and more people will be pulled in to what is a clear unfairness. And I guess if we look at that statement by Rachel Reeves, front page of the mirror, never had it so bad. I mean, and, you know, it seems like all the tax cuts here and they were really tinkering around the, the fact that there doesn't seem to be much money left. Yeah, I, I, I can never remember Labour saying we're going to inherit a golden <laughs> oh, <in fairness. laughs> time whenever, Labour, whenever they <laughs> replace anyone. the Tories. But there is some, there is, I think there is something in it this time. Britain's in recession, taxes are um, at, a, at a record high. The, over, the overall take, uh, productivity is low, public services are really under strain. Um, so it would be a poor inheritance, but interestingly, Labour has already uh, been a closed off, raising the income tax, capital gains tax, corporation tax, no wealth tax, no mansion tax. So apart from closing uh, a, f a few loopholes, I can't see what she'll do. And maybe she's going to lose uh, non-dom as well. <laughs> you know, the uh, two billion she was expecting to get from it. But, she, time, but she's right. It will. It's a. It's a poor inheritance. 1997, when Labour came in, the economy was doing quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yes. It, I mean, it's Labour are going to say this, aren't they? The Tories have smashed the economy. You know, everything's terrible. And um, you know, they're, they're right in some respects. Things are really bad, and um, the economy's not doing that well. But um, as 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 um, as Kevin points out, what are Labour going to do that's any different? Because they don't have any... Under Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor's fiscal rules, Labour can't spend any money that, if, that doesn't meet their rules, which means they, they're not going to have money to invest in public services. They're not going to have money to change all this around. They're going to have to hope that the economy is better when the election's called, which is what Rishi Sunak will be hoping for before he calls the election. Well, she, she's taken images, too, uh, that uh, Cameron and Osborne used in 2010 when they talked about, uh, accused Labour of not fixing the roof when the sun was shining. All of a sudden, you know, you, you've got the windows uh, smashed the door down and uh, burning the whole house down. It's not just the roof, a bit more. We've got just a minute 30 to look at this story, front page of the Daily Mail, so, Claire, I might ask you about it. Yeah. Um, Prime Minister tells police chiefs time to end mob rule. And uh, Rishi Sunak uh, uh, called police chiefs to Downing Street yesterday and it's all about imposing mob rule and it's all about, of course, the pro-Palestine marches. Yes, so there's a huge concern in the government about the toll of these marches. They're almost every other weekend and they're taking a huge... Um, 
that it's costing a fortune to police them. I think it's 12 million or something. And um, there are concerns in government ranks that they're not, they've not got enough money to, um, to do all of this. And so it's about money, Kevin. It's a, yeah, it's not mob rule, though. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can be against the marchers and <coughs> they create disruption, I get that, and there's always a fringe mm. who shout very obscene things, but it's, but it's not mob, that's not mob rule. I think going to Tobias Elwood's house yes. in Bournemouth, yeah. that, well, that was, was mobby, but the, around Westminster, I've, uh, I've seen worse times uh, over Brexit and uh, the anti-vaxxers over, over COVID. Mm. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Stay uh, with us. Coming up, Prince Harry suffers a setback at the High Court. We'll discuss that next. Welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview with me now, Kevin Maguire and Claire Ellicott. OK, let's go to the front page of the Metro. Story about Prince Harry. Quite a brutal headline, I think. Yeah. Um, we can pull it up. Um, there it is. You are not that special. And this is all about him being entitled, or rather not being entitled to police protection when he's in the UK. He felt he was hard done by. A judge did not agree, Claire. Yes, so this is um, the High Court has ruled that he, he is not entitled to proper full-time royal protection. So if you're a working member of the royal family, you, you're entitled to full protection. He's not. He obviously decided not to do this anymore. He moved to the, to the US. Um, but this is about when he comes back, whether he's entitled to proper protection. And um, the Home Office, and, and I think there's a, there's a group called RAVEC, aren't they? And there's, a, yeah. the, there's, you know, they have, like, police service, police serving on them and the Home Office, and they decided that he would only be entitled to bespoke care, so he'd be treated to, to, to bespoke security. So he'd be treated like other VIPs when he came yeah. to the UK. He appealed against, the, against his judgment, took them to court, and the High Court's ruled in the government's favour. And um, he's now appealing this, but mm. um, I think there's an estimate he's run up a million pounds in, in legal bills. And... I mean, the decision's been made, but do you think, I mean, to both of you, do you think he had a point that maybe he, he, he does need it? Well, I can... No. No, look, he gets it, but it's just, you know, it's bespoke. bespoke they, ass yeah. they assess the threat and then they look after him if, uh, if need be. He's in the States where, you know, every other person has a gun. Uh, I would have thought you were more in danger there. He pays mm. for his security there. If he wants extra security when he comes, why should we as taxpayers have to foot that bill? Because he boasted he killed or admitted he killed 25 yeah. in people book, in, in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, yeah. Uh, you can... Because that's you... the thing he says, Al-Qaeda. Yeah, well, well, he, well, don't say these things. Uh, he, in one yeah. way, I, I admired his honesty and lifting, you know, lifting the curtain, lifting the veil and telling us what actually goes on mm. when, you, when you fight. But if you do that, of course, there are potential consequences. But look, I'm sure you're safer in Britain than the U US. Just look at the difference in gun deaths. Yeah. Uh, so, but he, I don't see why he thinks, right, I'm going to live over there, I'm going to make all my money, but then I want all the you know, privileges that I, I had before. So he is appealing. We'll see how that goes. Let's go to The Guardian now, front page. Largest review of ultra-processed food warns of 32 damaging effects. And this is actually a massive study yeah. on the impact of ultra-processed food. And, you know, it's not good for you, which I guess perhaps some of us might have, you know, come to our own conclusion on that. But it is a very specific. Claire, tell us a little bit more about the study. Yes, yeah, so as you say, it's a huge study. It's 10 million people and they've followed them for a number of years. And um, the conclusion is that ultra-processed food is linked to these 32 harmful effects, heart disease, higher risk of cancer, early death, adverse mental health. We've sort of all, ha we've had little kind of studies about this. We all sort of know that ultra-processed food isn't good for us. But this is probably the most compelling study that we've seen yet, the largest review. And um, what's really interesting about it is that you know, most of the British diet is ultra-processed. It's, I think it says there it's more it's than half. It's a sort of fancy, scary-sounding name, but basically it's yeah. anything in a packet. Yeah. Like anything that you have to open. Anything that doesn't yeah. really resemble a whole food, anything yeah. that's, you know, most it... bread's ultra-processed. Yeah. You know, the bread yeah. we buy and eat in our sandwiches is ultra-processed. Paninis, yeah. they're, they're all... Yeah. Yeah. More than know. half, typically, of a diet. Or if you're it's poor or young, 80%. Uh, mm. we, do, we do know. Look, it's, it's tasty, it's convenient. Uh, I eat it myself. Uh, 
there's only so much broccoli you're going to have. <laughs> uh, but uh, but at, the, at the same time, I, you know, I think we, you almost need an, an education yeah. process and somehow try to change the manufacturing to make it as safe as possible. And, and I don't know if it was in this study, but I read somewhere that actually children tend to have much more ultra-processed yes. food than adults yeah. because, again, the sort of convenience of its What's the things, you know, protein bars, cereals... Um, Speaking of cereal, yeah, cereal. Oh, what a lovely segue. <laughs> Let's go to the front page of the Daily Star. <laughs> we can shoehorn it in. Let them eat flakes. Go on, Kevin, quickly. Yeah, this is the... <laughs> his name's Gary Pilnick. I think we'll just call him Gary Pillick. Oh. He uh, is the three million pound a year head of uh, Kellogg saying eat, uh, you know, eat um, cereal if you uh, can't afford anything else for, for dinner. Well, Kellogg's is very expensive. It's One, expensive, shift, expensive. shift a supermarket own brand and give him a kick in the uh, wallet <laughs> for that. Claire? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, well, I entirely agree. I mean, and also it's an ultra processed food. It's yeah. not, where are these nutrients that you need? Where's the broccoli? You can't Where's eat that for dinner. You're, you're probably better off eating the cereal <laughs> box than the cereal, isn't it? Broccoli for every meal. <laughs> Kevin and Claire, uh, you'll be with us in the next hour, but thank you so much uh, for now.